looking at right now with the Supreme Court and the NLRB. I know. What's the what's the odds of that happen? I mean, I mean, the odds of that happening. It's a small. You know, I, 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 there is no precedent for that of two justices recusing themselves, uh, especially one recusing himself because his wife is ar- arguing the case. It reminds me of that old Einstein joke about the the father and the son getting into a car accident. The father's dead and. The surgeon says, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. Right. <laughs> it feels like that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, what's the, uh, those 600, those 600 rulings, uh, that, that's got some serious, the limbo for that has got to be unbelievable. What, what's the, you know, what's the consensus on that, on all those rulings with the, you know, now that they, they've ruled that these appointments are unconstitutional? Well, the, the, the Circuit Court of Appeals has shown a certain amount of deference to, the executive and the high court. They know that their interpretation of the Constitution here flies in the face uh, of basically 200 years Mm -hmm. of executive action. Basically, every president has has used the recess authority in this way. And what, what the justices in the appeals court said was that you guys, the president, can only use his recess authority for re, uh, for vacancies that occur during recess, so it's a, a, a very strict set of guidelines. And in mm-hmm. fact, that is word for word how it was set up in the Constitution. So it, it's a very strict interpretation of the Constitution. The only problem is that uh, Obama, uh, the Obama administration, has a lot of leeway because every single president before President Obama also use the executive authority pertaining to recess appointments in this way. So he he definitely has a a leg to stand on, basically saying, oh, well, everyone else was doing it, so I did it too. Mm -hmm. So the circuit court realized that their reading flew in the face of, you know, decades, if not centuries of practice. So they limited limited their judgment to just this particular case, the Noel Canning NLRB dispute. So they didn't automatically invalidate all of uh, the, the 600-plus rulings that have been issued under this board. That right. being said, they also said if anyone brings any challenges, if anyone brings any appeals to our court, our ruling sets precedent. So any, anybody and every, every, uh, every lawyer that we spoke to who's had a dispute before the NLRB told us, hey, if we file our appeal in, this, in the circuit, we are almost guaranteed a victory. So a, a lot of people are, are weighing their, their options right now. And some of these major decisions uh, pertaining to union disputes, they're surely going to get challenged. But, the, you know, the, the NLRB rules on all sorts of minutia as well. So, right. So, so some people, the, the only penalty the NLRB assesses on them is taping up a list of work rules that they didn't previously have taped up. So the, you, you don't expect those cases to be appealed. Right, out of, but, the 600, out of the 600, there's a lot of them that are small. Yeah, exactly. The vast majority of them are small. However, you know, that there are a bunch of major decisions mm-hmm. that they've issued. For, for example, they issued a decision that said that Facebook rants against your boss are considered protecting its speech that you can't get fired for what you post on social media anymore. You can actually sue your company for back wages. And the NLRB uh, set up uh, basically that standard that said, you know, if, if you go onto Twitter or Facebook and you say, you know who's a big a-hole? Mm-hmm. My boss. I hate that guy. You can't get fired. Right. So, so that, that's going to have major implications if, if that standard is upheld. And that's a case for sure to see be appealed. Yeah, it definitely be one. How many people it affect, considering the, what social media is now. Yeah, uh, so, so if you're going to curse out your boss on Facebook, <laughs> I'd do it tonight. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, so that's a big story. Now, the other story we wanted to talk to you that you wrote about last week, that I want to, want to, we'll, we'll go, go over a couple minutes, was the circus story that you wrote about last week and what you found uh, with the circus. And I wanted to just touch on that a little bit, give people a little bit of a background, uh, what, what, you ended up, what you ended up doing, spending some time. Uh, yes, spent um, the better part of a week with the circus. Mm-hmm. Uh, but basically, I, I wanted to go and, uh, and have some fun behind my wife's back. So my idea <laughs> was to go wash elephants and, you know, shovel their poop and, 
and hang out with all the elephant trainers mm -hmm. and, and see how these elephants are, are treated because there's been a, a decade long crusade for animal rights groups to take ringling's elephants away from them and these guys are so protective of their elephants that they wouldn't let me go near them the only thing i could do was, was feed them mm -hmm. so uh, basically the the story went from just a, a fun little feature piece to an examination of elephant treatment in captivity and but w what i found when i was on the circus is that the the only performers that are close to being abused are the Shaolin monks who, you know, break metal bars over each other's backs and mm -hmm. necks, and they, they do all sorts of cruel things to each other. These elephants are, are pampered. They're kept in, in spacious, spacious places. They're even given retirement homes. And Ringling burrs their own elephants, so they've been leading the way in artificial insemination. They've been leading the way in elephant treatment practices, and their science has taken them so far that a, a lot of these uh, that students and animal caretakers from other countries, countries with wild elephants, fly to Ringling, and Ringling hosts these guys and teaches them how to handle and maintain their elephant populations. So uh, along with taking care of their own elephants, they're helping taking care of the world's elephants as well. And it, it, was, it was a real eye-opening thing, because you always hear from these animal rights activists and these animal rights groups that Ringling is just a bunch of people exploiting elephants for a buck. But a, a third of Ringling's elephant population never actually performs. They en end up being born in, uh, to a Ringling facility. And what Ringling finds out is that these guys aren't suited for the circus, so they end up housing them and spending millions of dollars every year taking care of elephants that will never make a dime for them. Mm -hmm. no. So it, it was an eye-opening experience for me, especially you know, going in there and hearing all of the propaganda that's been waged against these mm -hmm. guys by animal rights groups, because that's been the dominant narrative. Yeah, and in, what about like the lawsuits? Didn't they just, didn't they just win a case? Y yes, yes. The, uh, the the animal rights activists who uh, waged a ten year battle, legal battle against Ringling, basically saying that animal cruelty had caused psychological problems in a former employee. It turned out the former employee was paid hundreds of thousands of dollars by these animal rights activists. Wow. So the judge, the federal judge, not only threw out the suit, they allowed Ringling Brothers to countersue. And the ASPCA actually just settled for, with Ringling for about, they agreed to pay uh, the circus about $10 million, which is 10% of what they take in every year. So it was a major settlement. This wasn't a, you know, here's a couple thousand dollars uh, in hush money because I don't want to deal with this. This was a major, major settlement. So the Ringling is has still uh, is still pursuing this lawsuit against all the other uh, animal rights groups that teamed with the ASPCA for uh, the initial suit against Ringling, and the judge has actually allowed them to go ahead and charge a conspiracy, a, a RICO, a, a mafia-like. A RICO status against these guys. Wow! And if now Ringling is only seeking to recover the twenty-two million dollars it spent in legal fees from this suit, but if they win, the judge and the the judge and the jury, whoever decides this case, can implement RICO standards, which will uh, entitle Ringling to three times the monetary compensation. Wow! So it could be a, not only a major victory for Ringling, but a major blow to these animal rights groups. Well, yeah. I mean, you see some of these uh, the the suits that come out, and you, sometimes you wonder, uh, is it is it money motivated? I mean, what's the real deal? You know, you see it with all kinds of things. And in this story, you, I mean, you broke it all down on what was going on, and uh, it's pretty amazing to me uh, to see that this actually went went in favor of of Ringley and the judge and where this ends up. I'm sure you'll be you know keeping us up to date on that. Oh, I, absolutely. I mean, but one of the things that I found most surprising is, you know, I've heard of all these animal rights groups because they always put on the ads that show, you know, uh, very sad-looking animals. And I, I was under the impression that groups like the ASPCA, all their money is used to go and take care of animals. It turns out that that's not the case. The ASPCA d doesn't even actually help out animals. What they do is they file lawsuits against people who handle animals. So that the money that you donate to the ASPCA is not going to set up animal shelters. They're going to wage lawsuits 
against. Wow. Against, so they, they take in $100 million every year, and mm-hmm. all of that money is used for basically po- political activity and legal activity. So I, it, was, it was an eye-opener for me. I, I personally don't sponsor any animals, but I, I, I do sponsor, um, you know, some, some children overseas. And if I found out that my money w- was, was being spent on, you know, legal representation mm-hmm. and suing, you know, people in other countries instead of taking care and feeding that child, uh, I'd, I'd be pretty disappointed. Yeah, I wonder how many people have donated that really don't know where the money's going. Ooh, big story. I, I, absolutely. We, I, we spoke to, uh, or I, I spoke to a, a few people at animal shelters. Uh, none of them would go on the record because they don't want to cross the ASPCA. Right. And a, a lot of them are, are very much opposed uh, and uh, envious of the ASPCA because basically people write a check and they say, okay, I've done my, my part for animals. I'm going to move on to other things. And these people at the shelters are saying, no, you didn't do anything for the animals. You did a lot for lawyers. Wow. Well, Bill McMorris, you know, staff writer for Washington Free Beacon. What's Bill, what's the best way you want people to get in touch with you? Uh, get in touch with me. Uh, it's McMorris at Free Beacon. Send over any tips you want. Uh, you can follow me at F Bill McMorris. And I... Uh, on Twitter, and if you do, I'll tell you what the F stands for. <laughs> All right, Bill. Thanks right, for being thanks on tonight. Yeah, we'll see you soon. All right, yeah, talk yeah. to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah, I mean, I, 